life is rough. A little rougher when the walkers are after you. Join us as we watch through The Walking Dead once more. And bring you all the heartache. Easter eggs, hidden details. And survival tips that we can find. Related Geek now brings you... Sunday of the Dead. Warning, Sunday of the Dead contains spoilers for The Walking Dead franchise. Hello, everyone. Hello. Everyone. Hello. I'm Lainey. I am Marshall. And I'm Corey. That's Zeno down there. <laughs> yeah, kitty not making noise here. Uh, today we're going to talk about Season 1, Episode 5 of The Walking Dead called Wildfire. Now, the name of this episode, I'm just going to shout it out right at the beginning, is an homage to Michael Crichton's The Andromeda Strain, which also involves studying a pathogen in an underground laboratory. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I remember, I don't think I ever saw that movie. I just remember that these people stayed underground and... They couldn't go out. I remember seeing that movie, but I don't remember a huge amount about it. Remember they had like an underground bunker and then they couldn't go up because the virus was up there. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So let's talk about viewership. Its initial broadcast was on November 28th, 2010. It was watched by 5.56 million viewers, which increased in viewership from the previous episode. At the time, it was the highest rated episode of the series in both overall viewership and in the 18... To 49 demographic. Yeah, it went up about a million because I think oh, it was like yeah. 4.6 or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty, pretty awesome. And I think it's because, yes, word was starting to spread about this. And, you know, it's starting to get to the end of the season. So people are like, oh, you got to watch. Well, so the show I think... was also a big shift, too, because mm-hmm. AMC, you know, when they're first doing their own original stuff, it was like, oh, this is what the grown ups talk about, right? right? This is like, this is Mad Men. This is that going after that HBO kind of prestige, you know, and then you come in with something so genre, so nerdy, so Mm Comic-Con as Walking Dead, it really changed kind of what AMC was about. Mm -hmm. For sure. So we begin this episode. Rick is talking to Morgan on the walkie-talkie. It's Dawn. It's his morning check-in, updating him on the current situation. I did make a note here that he is visibly sweating, and it probably is very super humid in Georgia. And Mm -hmm. as people who live lower south than Georgia in Orlando, I can tell you that the humidity is insane, even at dawn. Yeah. And at certain parts of the year. Yeah. Lately, when I've been going to work for my shifts that start at 7 a.m., it is oppressively hot and humid. Yes. Yeah. And they were always filming in the summer for the show. Yes. Yes. So that's, man, I really hope they kept them hydrated. <laughs> Andrea is sitting vigil over Amy. She won't talk to anyone. People keep trying to come up and talking to her. She won't talk. She's just sitting there. Uh, Daryl is making sure the walkers are dead so they can throw them on the fire. They're all discussing all the different ways they want to deal with the walkers and with Amy. Mm -hmm. Shane just wants to deal with it. Rick goes to talk to Andrea and she pulls a gun on him. She's like, no. (laughs) I know how the safety works now. (laughs) No. I shouldn't have shown you then. (laughs) Glenn is reminding them that there are two stacks, one's for the geeks and one's for their own affected people. So they're actually separating them out. We don't burn our own. We don't Mm -hmm. burn our own. They are burying their own. Jim got bit during the attack, said, oh, I was just scratched. Well, you know what? That doesn't matter either. Yeah. Because I think you get it either way. So (laughs) Yeah. And we want to bring up, no matter what's going on, if you are in these kinds of survival situations, don't hide that you have gotten infected by anything. Don't try and be like, oh, no, I'll be okay. You need to be forthcoming about every injury and every infection that you have Mm -hmm. because you do not want this thing to spread. If you're in a zombie apocalypse, you definitely don't want it to spread. And as we learn later, there is a way you can deal with it and still stay alive. Mm -hmm. But not in this case with him because it's in his torso. Um, But we'll talk about that later when someone else gets bit and how they deal with it. And he was alive for a while. Yes. When we are looking at these bites, we've seen throughout that it's not actually a virus that the zombies have and are passing to somebody with a bite. It's the fact that they are like a Komodo dragon. They are filled in their mouth with a lot of bacteria and other contagions that when they bite you or they scratch you, that's going to be in giving you a major infection and it can that's what's actually lethal oh gotcha it's and probably also in this case that they're not obviously the humans 
don't have toxins, but their saliva. It doesn't have to be blood to no. blood. It could be, you know. Yeah, it's just they have to bite you because their mouth is filled with this bacteria. Mm-hmm. So now they're talking about should they go to the CDC in Atlanta or, as Shane says, should they go 100 miles in the opposite direction to Fort Benning? Well, what's really interesting about that is that later on we do realize, we are we do hear, that in Season 2, Episode 8, they run into these two guys, Dave and Tony, and they tell people in their group that Fort Benning is overrun by, quote-unquote, lame brains. That's what they call the walkers, the lame brains, which I thought was funny. So that might not be the best idea at this point, but they don't know that because, you know, there's no internet that they can be like, what is the situation in Fort Benning? But even you then... Know. I feel like Shane's plan to go to a a major military outpost in the very beginning is a flawed plan because everybody's going to do it. Right. And that's a thing that happens at this point. We'll see later and even before this where Shane has actually been a good tactician for the most part. He was more prepared than most that um, he was more prepared for the, the pandemic, the apocalypse than others were, but he does have some chinks in that armor, and one of them is this, maybe because he, I would say he's got to be a veteran, the way he acts, because he, I think it's where he gets his knowledge from, but I think it's it's also his weakness in this case, because he's, he's like, we have to stay here because of the military, we have to, we, or we should go to a base, it's like his fallback position is the military strength. I got that same kind of feeling. Like he's ex-military and that's his safety. I wrote it down. It says Rick's tenuous shepherding of Shane. Mm-hmm. Where Shane is fine for a while because Rick's his friend. But occasionally he will do these kind of rebellious moments where he's like bucking Rick's authority mm-hmm. a lot. And so it's really interesting how that plays out in this in this season, but also in future seasons. But well. he does it. His opinions in this way are motivated by two things. Well, maybe it's only one thing. It's really, how does he look to Lori? Mm-hmm. Because when he makes this whole Fort Benning thing, and then he talks to Lori about it later, he really thinks Lori is going to agree with him that they need to go to the safer location. Whereas Lori doesn't totally agree with him about the whole thing. So then later on, he says, oh... Well, we got to support Rick, what he's what he's doing, so that he looks better to Lori. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that's like kind of, I also think his motivations in this too as well. So Daryl says he wants to kill Jim. He says he's bitten, we don't, he shouldn't be here. But Rick says we don't kill the living. So this is a running moral throughout this series, including the questions that come later on. How many people have you killed? They're talking about people and not walkers when they ask that question. So yes. I think you can tell the character of a person by whether or not they killed the living. At this point, Daryl, I don't think he sees Jim as living anymore. No. He sees him as pretty Infected. much dead. You're dead. It's 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 happening. You're just still happen to be coherent about it, right? Mm-hmm. I think later on Daryl does change his tune. I think it's all because of Rick, really. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, is the brother he was given and the brother he, you know Right, yeah, exactly. Takes on. Dale comes to pay his respects to Amy, so he's really the only one that can sit with Andrea and Andrea loves it. <laughs> You That's, know? That was where everybody else went wrong. Everybody else was coming up to her saying, we, you need to do this, you need to do that. And he's just like, I'm here for you. Again, just yes. like what he what he had kind of started to do with, with Jim earlier, mm-hmm. but then turned and walked away. Right. So he tells this whole story about how he lost his wife Irma to cancer. So he knows what it's like to, to look at someone that you're waiting to die. You're reminded it's Amy's birthday, so she's getting that mermaid necklace. But I do want to bring up something maybe a little beforehand, but I don't really know where else to put it, that we learned from the comic... I don't even think Corey's gotten to this point yet. Yeah. But we learn in the comic that Dale and Andrea are romantically involved later on. And so I'm trying to figure out, like, the time difference in the comic versus the age difference in the TV series. Because Dale has said he's been a salesman for 40 years. So that, to me, says he's got to be 60. Yeah. Right? Around 60. Unless he started... Maybe in like in his, his early, early teens. teens, which would have not our later teens, which still means you were still in your 50s. Yeah. yeah. Right. So and Andrea, 
would in either case in her 30s probably right so it's like a 20 year difference so when that happened i was kind of like oh <laughs> wow <laughs> well that's something new well it's kind of funny too because uh, i mean you can swatch this around to the actual comic stuff but there's a woman in the comic book we don't see in the in the show, and she's all being like judgmental. About oh, Donna, the fact. yeah, Donna. She's mm-hmm. she's being all judgmental about the fact that Amy and Andrea actually stay in the RV with they Dave, sleep Dale. In the, in the, with mm-hmm. Dale. Yeah. So. Daryl's over there trying to kill shot all the all the dead people so they don't turn, and Carol comes up and says. No, it's my husband. I want to take care of it. And then she has this completely cathartic moment where she just beats the crap out of him. And Daryl looks at her like, wow, I'm a little bewildered, but also respect. Yeah. <laughs> I, and know? like when I saw that, there was almost this, he said non-verbally, I'm glad you got that out of your system. Yeah, it's the mm-hmm. beginning of the Carol Daryl relationship. Mm-hmm. And that's what I had in my notes too. I'm like, this is where they became friends. Right. I didn't have that. I just now dawned on me. So. Yeah. It's I think that this this episode is so interesting because I feel like it's an awakening for quite a few people. It's an awakening for Carol, very much so. Mm-hmm. It is kind of an awakening for Amy, and then not so much. <laughs> um, but I think I think this is kind of like the really good like pivotal point in the first season. So like I said, Amy wakes up. She is now a walker. Andrea apologizes. I think Andrea is both brave and stupid at this point yeah. because she's literally hugging her to herself while she's shooting her. So number one, the walker's mouth is right next to your neck. Number two, you just shot a gun Right next to right your next head. to your ear, mm-hmm. and didn't blow out your eardrum. As far as the Amy actress, like her performance up till this point, didn't have a lot of impact on me. But the way she played that waking up dead, yeah, the basically, subtle. was mm-hmm. really amazing. They apparently Very gave subtle. her different contact lenses too, so that it wasn't as harsh. Well, yeah, and I don't even mean just the opening of the eyes. The way she played it, the way she like did it really slowly. She wasn't like all of a sudden, ah, I'm going to bite you. It was right. like very slowly waking up, tilting her head forward. Just that whole mm-hmm. thing. It was like, we care about this character. Yes. So we're going to do this in a certain way. For sure. I really liked it. So Rick and Shane are burying the dead, and Shane blames Rick for leaving and taking half the manpower with him. That's his words. Half the manpower. And I'm sitting here thinking, so Shane, the people in your group, there's women. So are you saying that you think the women are too weak to fight? Because he's very angry that the, his quote unquote fighters were taken by Rick to Atlanta. Yeah. What do you guys think about that? You have to just go back to the first episode mm-hmm. and you see the pre-pandemic Shane, mm-hmm. his attitudes towards women. Like, yeah, he was very misogynistic. That doesn't surprise me at all. Also, if he is so concerned with the security of the camp with one person taking half of the quote unquote manpower, why didn't he man up and protect the camp by standing watch like Correct. a good soldier? Correct. Because he was too busy, his thoughts were on something else. Exactly. Namely, Lori. Jim is in the RV, becoming what I like to say, possessed by the spirit of walkers. Mm-hmm. It's coming on. Then the group goes to bury their dead. I have to say here, I feel like not a lot happens. Like I was, I was watching this episode, and I'm like, there's stuff happening in this episode, but it's not like okay, there's some action. There's some stuff yeah. following. It's kind of, and then they do this. Okay, that's great. So in this case, they buried the dead. Rick promises Carl he won't leave him again, which kind of makes him a liar because in season two, episode one, he leaves him again. Yeah. Yeah. Only two episodes away. Well, there's a whole lot that they don't even understand the full scope of where Oh, no, they don't. They've experienced Atlanta and the campsite at this point. They really haven't seen... And I think maybe it was in the comic, but somebody said that. They do. I mean, I just think that... I'm not trying to say that Rick was overtly a liar, because he didn't understand the situation, for sure. And in this case, he was just trying to comfort Carl. But he can't keep that promise. No. He just can't keep that promise. And Carl, at least according to the comics, I right. think he's like seven years old at this point. So Right, yeah. So you go into the RV and it looks like Dale is using an American flag as a curtain. 
I can't tell if he's doing it ironically or if he's <laughs> really just using it as a burden. At because true does. Americans aren't zombies. Right. At least it's not the uh, southern flag. There is also a jar of matchbooks in the on the little like table in between the two beds. So it looks like he might have like when he went traveling just collected matchbooks. I used to do that too, so I find that kind of fun as well. One of my favorite Jim quotes in this scene is that sound you hear, that's God laughing while you make plans. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about Jim's weird or they're either prophetic. Or their delusional thoughts. Yes. I can't tell what this is yet. So he says, and we're going to talk about this. Watch the mangroves. Their roots will gouge the whole boat. Amy is there swimming. You'll watch the boat, right? You said you would. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I did a look and mangroves symbolize support, particularly during upheaval. Mangroves are a type of plant that will grow on coastal regions and their roots will kind of go down into the soil and they prevent erosion specifically during like really hard weather. They take the brunt from tidal waves and hurricanes and things like that. But in this case, I feel like the mangroves are actually referring to Shane. When Rick was in the hospital, Shane stepped up in the middle of this upheaval to take care of the people that Rick cared about. And The problem is he's ultimately a poor leader because he is stuck. He is Mm -hmm. stuck in what he wants and what he's all about. Mm -hmm. So he wants security. He wants to feel like the big man. So he's not going anywhere. The other part of this is where he says Amy is there swimming. And in future episodes, Shane takes advantage of Andrea. And the two of them are kind of in a sexual relationship. Shane is really wanting to be with Lori, but is being with Andrea instead to get his frustrations Mm -hmm. out. Andrea is on a bender, and she's on a bender because she is grieving Amy. Amy is swimming there in the mangrove. But that's that's kind of why I feel like this is talking about. He is why I still think that he is a prophetic character, because he is like, Rick, you have to be watching out for Shane. And this is what Shane is going to end up doing. It's kind of interesting he talks about a boat too because Amy and Andrea were in the boat mm-hmm. at the beginning of episode yeah. 4. So that could be part of it as well. Like they were in the boat, but Amy's no longer here. Amy's swimming. So you have to watch the boat because if the boat dips over, you basically are all walkers. Exactly. Now, another thing that I noticed is that there's another episode in season 3 called Haunted where Rick is having these hallucinations of phone calls from other people. And they're, they're saying they're another group. But it turned out that they are all people he knew mm-hmm. from the past. And one of them was Jim. That's such a great catch. And Jim is questioning Rick about how Lori dies. That is like the core of Rick's boat. Mm-hmm. His family. Did you really watch out for your family? Oh, such a good catch. Shane goes to talk to Lori, and I'm going to bring this up because I noticed this with Jim. I noticed this with Carl, maybe Carol, too. I don't know. So do you ever notice that when Shane talks to people, he sits below their headline, he cocks his head to the side, pauses, and then speaks to them every single time in this really condescending manner? Yeah. So it's almost like, do you have your the attention on me? And now I'm going to speak to you. It's almost the bar fight kind of setup where you right. like somebody comes at you somebody says something to you sarcastically in a bar and then you're like you do the head tilt and you're like did you really say that to me kind right yeah. yeah yeah very confrontational right? it's almost like the behavior of dogs right because mm-hmm. he's trying to be the alpha male dog right yeah and so he's doing this you have my attention thing and there is an interview where he talks about that he used to be that guy he used to be that guy that would get into fights all the time Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He lived in Hollywood. He was on he was on a major network television show and he was still had that mentality and he had to like stop himself from being like that. Mm-hmm. So it's something he could slip into very easily in the show. So Shane and Lori talk about whether they're gonna go to the CDC and like I said, Lori basically surprises Shane by saying, Well, you know, there's merit in this. I think I agree with Rick in this case. There is some major shade thrown in both directions in this whole Mm -hmm. conversation. I'm not going to document all of this because, you know what? At this point, it's starting to get a little tiring. (laughs) Just like 
come on, get yeah, over it. Does she really think that? Or does she just doing that to spite Shane? Correct. Yeah. That is a very good point. So Shane says to Rick, okay, we're going to go to our sweep. I can see that Dale is behind him, although he tends to get delayed a little bit in this whole situation. So he shows up later. Let's talk about this. They have a little discussion, Rick and Shane, where Shane almost says something like, you know, that I took care of people for mm-hmm. you while you're gone. And then Rick goes off and you see Shane kind of put Rick in his sights in his gun. This is one of the first times that Shane considers killing Rick. Hashtag he also considers killing the living. But what he doesn't see is that Dale comes up behind him and clocks him doing this to Rick. Mm-hmm. I put hashtag Dale sees all. Because he kind of does. Yeah, well, that's his spot, you know, to be up on the, the camper. And, mm-hmm. yeah. He's the lookout. So Shane's and, like all trying to play it off. Uh, just, you know, we should wear reflective vests because, you know, I didn't just walk out here with him. But the tone of his voice said something very different. Oh, it really did. The tone of his voice was saying, this is the truth. And if you say anything, I'm coming after you next. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there are no, there's no place for an oracle in Shane's world. No. Right. So they go back to the group and guess what? Shane all of a sudden decides he's going to back Rick. Why? Because of this conversation with Lori. And so now they're going to stay together. But he says, if you don't want to go to the CDC, you don't have to go. Mm -hmm. You can part ways. And I think he's making a tactical choice here as well Mm -hmm. because he knows, okay, Dale just saw me almost kill this guy. I'm going to have to now play in support of him. But if I have any chance of being the leader and alpha dog here, I have to make a breakaway group. Correct. So he gives them an out. He's playing survivor. (laughs) Yeah. But that just doesn't really work in his favor either at this point. (laughs) So we're going to the next morning now where Rick is talking to Morgan on the walkie and saying, guess what? Remember the CDC? You told me all about this. We're going to go. I'm going to leave a map on the Dodge Challenger. And if you want to follow us, follow us. I hope, you know, everything's going okay with you and your boy, etc. I had forgotten that Morgan was the one who told him you should go to the CDC. Morgan, I had forgotten that too, yeah. (laughs) So now they're back in the camp. Jim is waking up. And Morales comes to the group and say they decide to go to Birmingham, which is where their family is. So this is where Shane's plan kind of falls apart because they're not going to Fort Benning. They're going to Birmingham. Yeah. So he's like, whatever. Rick gives Morales a gun. Carl is crying because they're leaving. Again, I say, you know, Mm -hmm. he's such a big heart because they're leaving. And Eliza gives Sophia her doll. This is an important doll, guys. Why? Yeah. Comes back next season. Mm-hmm. Very important doll. Now, Very one great. thing that I think we want to track later on, when there is this conflict between Morales and Rick as Morales the Savior, what gun is he using? Because it'd be very interesting if he's using this exact same gun. It would be. I would like to talk about the cars in the caravan as they are leaving the campsite. Mm-hmm. I did... A lot of pausing and Wow, re-watching. this is some good notes you have here. Holy crap. Um, so at first I thought there was only three vehicles. There turns out to be five vehicles if you're not counting the Morales family. The first one is the RV, which contains Dale, Glenn, Jim, and Jackie. Then there's an SUV that has Rick, Lori, Carl, Carol, and Sophia. So they got the kids together. Then there's a van that looks like has Andrea and T-Dog riding together. Shane is in some kind of Jeep because it has no like outer top covering. It looks mm-hmm. like the, you know, those Jeep that you would take the sides and top yeah. off. He's, it looks like he's by himself. Daryl's in a truck with his motorcycle in the back by himself also. So those are the people that are leaving to go to the CDC. But I think you remember in a previous episode, I talked about the fact that there were 11 unnamed survivors, and three of them were bitten, Mm -hmm. which would leave eight. They did not go with the Morales family, I'm assuming, because they don't know people in Birmingham. Where are they? Well, one thing that I did notice is, yeah, that there was, when they were doing the burial scene, Mm -hmm. that the truck came up with five corpses on it. Oh, yes. Okay. One of them was Amy, and one of them was Ed, Mm -hmm. and that means that there was three corpses that they're burying which were the ones that i clocked from before from the last episode yeah we're still at eight people where are these eight people well they may have also decided to go their own way that's true they might have they're not in any of the scenes where they talk about going their own way or anything like that those people have disappeared <laughs> they're yeah. gone well, it's also one of those things just from a tv perspective not a story perspective that mm-hmm. 
they made a decision. You know, this this first season's only six episodes. Right, and yeah. so they're still figuring out a lot. Frank Darabont, I don't know how much he hit, TV he had done. But I do know that he was at odds with the network. Mm -hmm. So they might have just chose to go, well, we'll just disregard the, the rest of the background right. players. So. Mm -hmm. The music that is being played as they leave the campsite and on through into the next scene where they have with Jim is a piece called Sunshine, Adagio in D minor by John Murphy. You can actually go on to John Murphy's YouTube and listen to this song. But it's, you know, it's a really beautiful, like, dramatic instrumental piece there are no words it's just this mm -hmm. thing but i thought it was interesting that it's called sunshine because they think there's all this hope in atlanta at the cdc and so it's all sunshine but is it really is it really so then the rv breaks down again jim it's is a also a hose yes jim is also getting worse but I wanted to talk about the Winnebago. I know there are some things on the inside of the Winnebago that I can't catch all of it, but I was able to watch like a Behind the Walking Dead on their YouTube channel of the guy who plays Dale looking through his RV and showing you things about it. I have to say, though, it's very fuzzy. It's a very <laughs> fuzzy video, so I couldn't see everything I wanted to see. But here's some things I could figure out about that Winnebago. It's a 1977 Winnebago, so it's literally one less year than me. The number on the top is 9866. I don't know if they numbered all their Winnebagos. I can't remember what that number means, where it's like right on the top where if you had someone sleeping above the cab, that's where it is. In the kitchen area, there are some mini antlers with a, a blue lay hanging from it, which I thought was funny too. Mm -hmm. In the bedroom, there is a book on search and seizure. And as uh, the guy who plays Dale says, it's very important to know how to do search and seizure when you're in the zombie apocalypse, obviously. There is also a cartoon on the wall that says drill, baby, drill. That was the only thing that I could figure out what it said. There were a couple other things on the walls. They had lots of like stickers and stuff. There is a green canoe on the top of the RV and it's not the Winona canoe because the Winona canoe is silver aluminum. This is a different canoe that is green. Weird. Yes, it is very weird. I mean, I'm glad they're taking the canoe, but... Maybe it went with one of the other survivors that went their own way. Could and, be. And who's to say that it necessarily was his? I mean, we don't know. Right, we don't know. They do say that it's all his. Dale seems to be a very humanitarian person, but that drill, baby, drill sticker or whatever is kind of interesting because that's all about drilling the Great White North. So at this point, Jim says he wants to be left behind. So they put him up against a tree on the side of the road... Say bye-bye. Bye-bye, Jim. Now, we are at a completely different location. So we are starting with a transmission that says, Wildfire, MSB 3417, active, begin transmission. And we are introduced to an entirely new character named Jenner. And Jenner is played by Noah Emmerich. And Noah Emmerich is best known for The Truman Show, where he was like Truman's best friend. And he is an FBI or probably CIA agent in The Americans. Oh, interesting. So Jenner says that it's day 194 since wildfire and day 63 since the disease went global. What is wildfire? Wildfire being the outbreak of the disease when it first probably began. Although I did a search to try and find what is the wildfire protocol for the CDC. And all I found was safety tips during a wildfire. So that might not actually be one of their internal things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, no, yeah. I think it really is just something that they pulled from Andromeda Strain. So there really is like about 150 days between the wildfire and... The disease went global, really? Yeah, before it actually like hit global, yeah. Yeah. So Jenner is doing some tests in the lab, and he knocks over a vial, which causes him to set off an alarm due to some hazard that spills on his gloves. And that, in turn, sets off an explosion to decontaminate. And his samples, which are TS-19, which are the freshest samples that they have, are gone. Mm -hmm. All the other samples that they've been able to get are flesh that are decomposing. And TS-19 is the freshest. And we don't find out anything about TS-19 until the next episode because that's the name of the episode. Mm -hmm. but, but there is some interesting other things going on here in this episode here. Because this transmission is basically the daily logs of this scientist. 
And in the top right, you have this gobbledygook, which, you know, if you look at it, it's actually a memory location on a digital file system. But in the bottom left, it says B2DAA ZON5 ATL, mm -hmm. which seems like it says Zone 5 Atlanta. But I think that this is actually referring to an area within the facility that this command center is Zone 5, because I actually looked it up and the CDC has broken up America into a number of areas and the CDC in Atlanta is area two head oh. office B2DAA at the bottom left. It is, I found it kind of funny. It's actually an abbreviation for a podcast called basement to the attic, which is a hip hop culture podcast. Why would that be included? I have no idea. Maybe it's the writers putting something they like, giving a shout But also like. this, and this is, this is where I'm kind of coming from is that, this is a guy who is in an underground facility sending a transmission to somewhere else, his higher ups, the uh, attic. Right. <laughs> so they're going to talk now about the CDC itself as the group is arriving. This is not the real CDC in Atlanta. This building overlooks I-75, just south of I-285. And this is the Cobb Energy Performing Arts Center Yeah, in it looked a little bit dynamic yeah. in yeah. its architecture for the CDC. Right. So they have, you know, Broadway shows and concerts and ballets and things like that there. The actual CDC has a free museum with exhibits that tell the story of the agency and its life-saving work. But... Producers of the show were not allowed to photograph the interior of the actual buildings as part of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention as a point of reference due to its high security, obviously. And in the next episode, he's going to get into why is this place have such good security? Yeah, right? you don't want Shane just accidentally bumping over, knocking something over. and. Mm. So Jenner basically says in his video, I don't know why I'm talking to you. I'm just going to go get drunk. I might kill myself tomorrow. I haven't really decided. Let me throw this bottle across the room. And what is that on my security camera? So there's the group. Rick and this group are running up to the building. They're screaming, please let us in. It's getting dark. We can't be here after dark. And then Rick sees the security camera move. And he's like, wait, there's someone here. And people are like, no, 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 no. That's just a trick. No, so he starts screaming some more, and finally, the doors open just as darkness falls in a dramatic fashion. And see. A little bit of the extras that we have for this episode. I found on the Wikipedia that they say that Jim's death is considered the 35th most important death in the series. I kind of want to see this list and see who else is on this list in the order that they're saying. Who does what it? What list? Which I got it from Wikipedia. That That's what, word for word verbatim, what Wikipedia says. They I should, don't know what list they're talking about. They should have a reference for it. They the, should, but they the didn't. Well, no. I, I'm going to say that number one was probably Glenn. <laughs> spoilers. Much? Oh, please. Mm -hmm. We all know this now. We have spoilers here. And as far as the comic connection, there isn't a lot about the CDC in, in the comics. In fact, mm -hmm. they don't go to the CDC in the comics. But there is a very major thing I wanted to touch on. The end of the chapter one of volume one of the graphic novel, which is pages 116 to 139, is what takes place after the attack. It is so interesting. It actually kind of blew me away. So after the group buries everyone from the attack, Rick and Shane kind of come to the screaming head, kind of like they did before. Like, I was taking care of your family. To the point where he practically admits that he was sleeping with Lori. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Practically. He said, you coming back has ruined my life. Basically. Yeah, basically. And then he turns a gun on Rick. So they're in the standoff, as, as it happens. And all of a sudden, you see this frame where it looks like Shane has been hit in the neck by a bullet. The next frame is Carl with the gun trained on Shane, and it says, So don't hurt my daddy again. And Shane dies. Yes. So I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, comment. Shane is no more. But, you know, Shane is more in this TV show. I mean, I feel like he's a catalyst for a lot of things that happen in season two. So I'm not... I understand why they decided to keep him around. They needed a villain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Within Shane the, really is the villain of season the two, group, in my yeah, opinion. They, it, yeah. It helps to have him in the, in the group. Just yeah. as a little coda on there that after shooting Shane in the comic, Carl says to his dad... As he's hugging him and crying, he says it's not the same as killing the dead one's daddy. One thing that I noticed though is that the end music 
it is an instrumental music, mm-hmm. but it is the main theme song slowed down and changed just a little bit so that now it's more of a somber, sad song. Oh, interesting. So it, it's kind of warning you, this may not be as good as you think it is. Right. right. Well, everybody, that is Season 1, Episode 5, Wildfire. Next week, we're going to talk about Season 1, Episode 6, the finale of the season, TS-19. Thank you for listening to Sunday of the Dead and exploring each episode with us. If you have any interesting facts or details about an upcoming episode, feel free to email us at share at elatedgeek.com. We want to bring you new and exciting geek-worthy content. If you want to help, please consider donating to our coffee account. The link is in the show notes and every donation is accepted with total appreciation for your support. Follow us on social media for more of our geek obsessions. Find Laney on at Zany Laney or me at One True Hazard. For updates, keep an eye on Adelated Geek on Instagram or Adelated Geek Tweets on Twitter. Or go to our website at www.elatedgeek.com. Links for these are in the show notes. Until next time. Geek out. <laughs>